it's really great to be here. I'm delighted to have gotten the invitation to participate in this really fantastic exploration of women's health and its funding uh, and reporting back to Congress. Now, I'm often asked to speak at, MI at NIH around devices that I invented. I've invented a lot of things that have been commercialized and are used widely around the world, the liver chip, ear on the back of the mouse, three-dimensional printing. I was involved in the original 3D printing at MIT. So there's a lot of technology innovation that I'm excited about that I do and others do that have impacted health. But what I wanna to do today is go to a higher plane. I wanna talk about innovation in problem definition. A good engineer invents technologies and applies them to things. A great engineer thinks about how do you go down and even decide what you should build. What are the design principles for using new areas of science to solve societal problems? So that's what I'm gonna focus on today, but I'm also gonna hit on some themes that have come up because I think they do need to be addressed repeatedly throughout the conference. I'm gonna frame my innovation analysis through the lens of endometriosis, which as Stacy Mismer and others introduced today is a chronic inflammatory disease that involves ectopic growth of the endometrium, including the glands and stroma outside of the endometrium. It can also uh, even invade the uterus. Um, it affects a lot of women, about 10% or so, often starting in the teenage years. And it can take years to be diagnosed. It causes, of course, debilitating pain, infertility, anemia. Treatments are largely around manipulating hormones. They don't work well for a lot of the patients. They can't tolerate them. They don't have response. And so patients will have surgery after surgery after surgery. And uh, often end up in despair and tears and patients who don't have access to great care just suffer. And you can go on the social media sites and see that. Now, um, I started doing research in endometriosis very late in my academic career. I was very well established and I got pulled into it by a fantastic endometriosis surgeon, Keith Isaacson, because I myself had endometriosis. I've had nine surgeries for it and uh, so on and uh, taken all the categories of drugs on this slide. I started having symptoms when I was 12. I got taken home uh, from school by the driver's ed, college. I would miss exams, grad school. I had to re- uh, uh, schedule my qualifying exam, et cetera. And so in a lot of ways, my experience, I was diagnosed accidentally when I was 28 years old. No one had ever mentioned endometriosis. Um, so in a lot of ways, I was the typical patient in 1988 when I was diagnosed. This is uh, the typical endometriosis patient as described in a textbook the year after I was diagnosed and two years before I started my faculty position. I taught endocrinology at Harvard Med School for a while and this textbook was referred to me. Um, so clearly uh, my experience in coming up with an image of pain that was so graphic, I went to the doctor every month for six months and then he finally scheduled a surgery, said, you'll be back at work in two days, we're just training a cyst, never mentioned endometriosis. I woke up the next day having had an open procedure for stage four endometriosis. So I'm a typical patient because I was in my late twenties. I was in grad school for chemical engineering and then a postdoc. And I had to beg and beg and beg for years and years to get a diagnosis. This is a diagnosis bias, okay? And if I was not white, I could still be waiting for a diagnosis according to some of my um, professional friends, clin clinical friends. So we have a severe diagnosis bias, but this was, you know, 30 something years ago, right? So that doesn't happen anymore. Or does it? So imagine how I felt when my niece, who um, 30 years younger than me, started complaining of pain and the same symptoms I had when she went into high school. She got sent for a lot of tests. She had a female OBGYN. I told the OBGYN the family history. She said, butt out, sent her for a colonoscopy. So when the colonoscopy is negative, she told my sister, she's making everything up to get out of going to school. This was my reaction. Lava shot straight out of my head. Lava shot out of my head because I got to refer to a surgeon. Her actual diagnosis when she was 16 was stage two, three endometriosis on her bowels causing the symptoms. Okay, so um, this is a motivation. We still are, women are still being gaslit even when they have resources access and are begging 
to have someone investigate. So let me just recap a few things that have been made uh, points earlier that healthy, we don't understand even the functions of a healthy normal endometrium. Normal menstruation is really still poorly understood. And, and, and you need to know something about the normal functions of the uterus just to be able to have a healthy pregnancy. So research in, in this is very, very much needed. How does it affect population health? the healthy uterus affecting the pregnancy and then the birth. We have over 500,000 hysterectomies every year in the US. I'm 61, a third of women my age have had a hysterectomy. We don't even know all the side effects of having hysterectomies. There are long-term consequences associated not only with hysterectomy, but probably with the underlying cause of the hysterectomy that can affect health in later life. And we know very little about this, but now, here is not just the elephant in the room, but a herd of elephants in the room. We know very little about how the cumulative morbidity of all these women's health issues, certainly gynecology, but also all of the chronic immune diseases um, that women have, how they may be contributing to the pay gap for women. And I'm gonna say it, and people don't always, aren't always comfortable hearing this, um, but there are data, some published, saying that women miss more work because they themselves are sick, not just because they're a caregiver, but because they themselves are sick than men do. What are the functional consequences? I know in my own case, I missed, I didn't throw teaching off the boat. I didn't throw uh, mentoring and service, all that. I threw consulting, all the things that paid well. I had to throw off the boat to deal with endometriosis surgeries. So I repeat, this is something we absolutely need better economic studies in US populations because it's not just an elephant, it's the herd all those elephants of all those chronic diseases. So uh, we're getting late in the day, so we're gonna be really graphic now and blunt. Those herds of elephants, I want somebody listening to study that. So to recapitulate something that, that Stacy Mismer described so beautifully in her talk, these data from um, the Mirren paper where he um, studied uh, NIH uh, data on uh, the, the funding levels per a metric of morbidity called the daily. And, and Ron Chandler at MSU plotted these data. And you can see that female skewed diseases shown here in red are, a lot of them are below this line. In other words, they get very little funding relative to their morbidity. And only one male skewed disease, liver cancer is sort of below the line. Endometriosis and other gynecology diseases are really, really in the bottom of the barrel. And some of them aren't even on there, like adenomyosis, which Stacey Mismer and colleagues just published is probably 10, per, 10 times as prevalent in the US population as we uh, suspect now. There's no RCDC category for it, okay? Even though it's probably as prevalent as endometriosis, which does have an RCDC. There's only two grants in all of NIH Reporter on, uh, on adenomyosis. One of them was an epidemiology grant a few years ago and one just started this year on the basic science. So yay for that one. Um, so we don't really know the daily because prevalence isn't really known, morbidity isn't understood. And reporter says there's 89 projects and that's a bit misleading if you go in, I even have a grant on endometriosis that mentions adenomyosis. It is not an adenomyosis grant. Okay, so there's been some discussion today about the nature of funding and who controls the money and how do we fund, and I'm gonna focus mainly on gynecology, and the issue of whether proposals that get funded were solicited through a request for applications or a FOA, and thus reviewed by a special emphasis panel, or whether they were investigator initiated. And I'm showing here data, thank you to Elizabeth Barr for compiling it, and thank you to my colleague at MIT Sloan School, Pierre Azule, and to Rem Koning, who was mentioned earlier today. He publishes a lot on innovation in women's health, and he's actually profiled me, who's at Harvard Business School, for suggesting this analysis. So you can see, overall at NIH, most grants are investigator initiated, but in women's health, the percentage of ones that are solicited by program managers is much, much higher. And so why is this a problem? Well, this was brought up by Melissa Simon and others. Um, an unsolicited grant, you have time to plan it. You can talk to the program manager. You can resubmit a proposal that doesn't get funded the first time. You can get feedback from the program manager on how did the review go? This is really, really important for early stage investigators. In contrast, solicited proposals, a FOA, 
um, you know, program managers work really hard. And I am so, so grateful to all the NIH program managers who developed FOAs over the years that I participated in because they, they really develop criteria. They, you know, they have to go through a lot of hoops internally to get a program developed. They may have to go to other institutes to get funding, but then they have to wait. And whenever the administrative approval gets finished, the FOA drops. The last one I responded to dropped the first week of fall term, a week I got a bee sting and then couldn't function for, you know, there was no way in the eight weeks I had to prepare the grant that I really wanted to, because you have to respond to exactly what the FOA wants. You can't just write the grant that's in your head. There's a set aside budget, no matter how many well score proposals they get, and you never can resubmit and you can't submit a renewal proposal. So, so many reasons why FOAs are just not good at nurturing a community. There's other things in review, you know, standing study sections have a stable cadre of reviewers, they're vetted by a nomination process, et cetera, et cetera. Solicited, everybody's in conflict. Who do you even get to respond to the, be on the, um, who do you even get to, to, to be on the panel? So there's all kinds of issues, meaning that if you go by that route, it's really hard to get a really good, robust research community that has standards and mentoring for young people, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think that there's a lot of issues that need addressing. So uh, my biggest recommendation out of this talk, and then I'm gonna get to the fun innovation part in a second, is that we really, really need an outside analysis of this multifaceted problem. There's a chicken and egg, certainly in gynecology, but in many areas of women's health. There's no Institute for Reproductive Health. It goes through child health and development, many competing research areas. What's in a name? A lot of stuff is in a name. So then you get into this whole do loop that we talked about with no dedicated funding and who's looking out for it, et cetera. So there are people in the outside community, outside of NIH, and I became aware of these when I was on the advisory committee to the director of NIH, Francis Collins Advisory Committee, and Mike Lauer and others proposed the grant score index, which was freaking everybody out. And uh, Francis Collins and Larry Tabak agreed that we should get a, maybe get an outside analysis of this. So I hooked up, linked up with Pierre Azule and others who, who do analyses of data from the census, from the IRS and so on, very sensitive data. And they do it through enclaves and they do it in a very, very scholarly way because there is a professional community at these organizations I list here. And the key to the data sharing agreements and these other things is that they share the data, not just out outcomes. So there's a very secure way that they can get in to NIH and then link to data in the census or other things. Okay, so we really need a data enclave set up so these kinds of investigators could help analyze NIH from the outsider perspective and look at questions on how proposals are funded and so on. And so there's many questions that one would come up with to drill down at a very granular level. Um, all right, so now let's talk about innovation. Okay, and so we'll start. NIH embraces innovation and technology. There's no question. And this, this is a project by my wonderful colleague, Regina Barzilay, who's a superstar in machine learning and natural language processing. And um, what she did when she got breast cancer um, is she started doing analysis of mammograms. And so she invented a way to use machine learning to take a mammogram and predict the probability that a patient will have cancer in the next two years, five years, et cetera. And she is very adamant about including all um, races and ethnic groups in this. So she's, she's really, really committed to that. And this was just recently published work. Okay, so um, breast cancer is pretty well funded. And I'm happy for that because I'm a breast cancer patient. And I can tell you having breast cancer was a walk in the park compared to having endometriosis. And I've said that in public many times, and I'll say it again, most people do survive breast cancer. And if you survive it, it can be a very manageable thing. Endometriosis, not so much. Okay. So artificial intelligence, which every, all, you know, big data, all the rage, it's only affected though, if you've got um, a lot of images or well-curated data that you have access to and that the questions are well-posed to match the data. Most therapeutic and treatment and development are outside this realm though, especially in gynecology and women's health. So let's, for example, say artificial intelligence and adenomyosis, okay? I know some people are asking, what's adenomyosis? So let me tell you, it's when it's the sibling and maybe the twin of endometriosis. It's when you have the endometrial glands and stroma growing in the muscle of the uterus itself. 
you don't see this when you have surgery for endometriosis. So some patients with symptoms, they'll have surgery, the surgeon won't find endometriosis, and then the patient's told nothing's wrong with her and she's freaking out, but she has symptoms from adenomyosis. And these are some images from a postdoc in my lab. So why haven't you heard about it if you haven't heard about it? So let's do a calibration. PubMed publications are a proxy perhaps for research intensity in a field. And another area that I have research in because my lab has active research in many areas to pay the bills. I work in Crohn's disease with some lovely folks at MGH. The incidence in the US population of IBD is around 1%. And here's the number of PubMed citations recently, okay? Adenomyosis, which if we divide by two, which is, gives you the incidence in the US population, um, so about 10% maybe in women, um, here's the number of PubMed citations, 5% of the number. Okay, let that sink in. Here's something that is maybe five times more prevalent than Crohn's and Crohn's is bad, but so is adenomyosis. And here's how little we know. Okay, so let's think about, can AI help with diagnosis and prognosis? Well, it's really impossible to innovate when there's no infrastructure, no uh, data sets, okay? So the incidence of adenomyosis is underestimated. It's not routine standard of care to screen for it. Most gynecologists don't know. Um, if you could use NLP to look at EMRs, um, probably 90% is missed. And Stacey Missburn and colleagues had this paper here that suggests that we tried to do uh, NLP on Keith Isaacson's patient uh, databases going back 10 years with Regina Barzilay, and it was a mess and we gave up because it is so hard because nothing is standardized. The language is even hard to parse, okay? It's also, you can't process the images we have. AI requires at least 10,000 images taken in a standardized format with known outcomes in a standardized way in the EMR. Ultrasound is nowhere standardized like mammography, okay? So you can't do it, okay? And no feasible biopsy process right now to correlate the outcomes exist. You gotta have outcomes data, right? There is no reason with 500,000 hysterectomies a year that we can't build this kind of database. We should be able to build the evidence-based structure on biopsies too. There's just not been the commitment to it. We should be able to do this, okay? Now, what about therapy development? And adenomyosis, let's kind of link it with endometriosis. They're similar, okay? With, you know, there's been enormous progress in analyzing genome and linking genomic data to human health and diseases. And there's a lot of rare diseases for which genomic insights have just been transformative. Look at Vertex, a local company where a bunch of my students and postdocs just um, have started, you know, been to work, cystic fibrosis drugs, et cetera. So there's tremendous, tremendous advances. But many women's diseases do not have a smoking gun gene. There's many, many SNPs, many, many gene environment interactions. So you can't take it and then going from a gene to a function, especially if the gene operates in many different cell types is really hard. Okay. And so genomics analysis right now gives you some clues, but it really rarely gives you answers. This is a fabulous study uh, recently published by Corinna Zondervan and a labor of love with people all over the world in science translational medicine in which they did a genetic linkage study of endometriosis. And they identified a variant of a particular receptor that was enriched in women who had endometriosis. So this suggests maybe here's a non-hormonal drug target. Okay, that was, it's a beautiful paper. I encourage everyone to read it. But here's the thing. These blue are women who have the variant, but who do not have endometriosis. So we have a long way to go to understand personalized medicine um, and whether this variant and this target may actually be for all women or will it be for a subset? We don't really understand this yet. So you can get clues, but not necessarily answers. So when I came into the field um, in, uh, 2009, um, I fortunately got breast cancer right after we got a foundation grant to start working together with Keith Isaacson. And the amazing thing about breast cancer is immediately I was phenotyped to being triple negative. The, the doctors didn't say, oh, your tumor is three centimeters. Here's what we're going to do. No. Three centimeters was taken into account, as were some other things, but I was ER negative, PR negative and HER2 essentially negative. And so this set off a huge, huge, huge um, shift in the way my colleagues and I started thinking about endometriosis and the potential for engineers to come in and reframe how we think about the disease. That it's not one disease that we should be able to figure out 
molecular classification. There's not bona fide somatic mutations we can hang our hat on, but there's probably molecular networks and mechanisms that are different among different patient groups. How can we figure these out? We can't just classify patients according to lesion burden. That's like saying my three centimeters dictates my breast cancer outcome. And clearly I um, did very well in chemo and here I am. Okay, so how do we do this? So we took an engineering approach where we said, um, uh, we're gonna, you know, we're not biologists, so we don't have a favorite pathway or a favorite molecule. We know that there are networks linking cells together in the immune system. So let's look at immune networks and invasion networks. So let's measure a whole bunch of indicators of activity of networks. And those measurements would be correlated if the network is out of whack or functioning properly, right? And so we did this, and I'm gonna take you through a huge study just as an example. And remember, I'm an engineer and I build things, but this gives me the kind of clue about what I should even be building, right? So we wanted, this is actually cited as the very first paper to describe a molecular classification of endometriosis patients. And we identified a new non-hormonal target, which is still in play. It was funded by a foundation, not by NIH. So we had almost hundred patients. We looked at peritoneal fluid because that's where inflammation is happening. We did a measurement multiplex of 50 cytokines. And then we did an unsupervised analysis looking for correlations in those cytokines among groups of patients. We gave no clinical data. We didn't say here's patients controls. We just said, are there groups of patients that have correlated changes in cytokines. Unsupervised does not mean hypothesis free. We had a hypothesis about immune networks, which is why we measured these. We identified a consensus signature of these cytokines in a third of the patients who had all stages of endometriosis by the surgical staging. We reverse engineered that immune network to test the, uh, and then predicted that a particular kind of macrophage was governed the inflammation response. And we furthermore demonstrated for the first time that an intracellular signaling pathway called June kinase was regulating this. So here is a potential non-hormonal therapy. We did another study on invasion um, that also implicated June kinase. So this is an amazing potential new target. And we learned, in fact, after we published our papers, that June kinase had cured multiple patient populations of endometriosis. Okay, they're shown here. Unfortunately, none were human. There was a human clinical trial. It was unsuccessful. There were some problems with that trial. Maybe the patient stratification. There's a lot of um, things around the chemistry of June kinase inhibitors. There's three different isoforms, et cetera. So pharma, who we wanted to work with to get new drugs in the clinic said, we need much better efficacy models. These animals are not cutting it. We need human models. So this is what we're doing now. We are building little models of endometriosis lesions using patient samples. We invented a whole new way to grow organoids from patients. Everybody around the world is asking, including Corinna Zondervan I mentioned earlier, wants to work with us around the technologies we have invented to grow these tissues from patients to study them. And this was actually supported by DARPA. I had a fabulous program manager and we only recently got NIH support for which we are incredibly grateful through NIBIB and through um, recently Child Health and Development. So we are now um, building little microvascularized lesions in these microvessel networks with colleague Roger Cam. And this is just some pretty movies of microvessels and a microfluidic device and immune cells moving through them, et cetera. Now, how does women's health drive innovation for all? We need better human models of all these chronic inflammatory diseases. Enough with the animals, okay? We have to have much better. Most of the models out there were never set up to do sex dimorphism because they use silicon rubber. I'm showing here on the left something that's very popular. It's very cute. It's a um, lung chip made at the Weiss Institute up at Harvard. Um, and it can never be used for, or it's very hard to use this for any kind of sex-based studies because PDMS is a sink for estradiol. Everything absorbs into it. We've been working forever because we care about this with hard plastics, this with our DARPA, but more recently we're funded to build endometriosis on a chip and we're translating all of this into a beautiful um, format that everybody can use and, and get out there with, with a format that can do sex dimorphism. So here's innovations coming for everyone driven by the need to study women's health issues. Now, I wanna um, wrap up uh, describing um, a model for NIH, uh, and I'm going to use the creation of our Department of Biological Engineering, which I was intimately involved in helping create at MIT, as a model for how we might think about um, collaboration at NIH. So when I started my career, we had biomedical engineering, which is 
all kinds of engineering are pride to problems in medicine. You don't need to know biology, maybe some physiology. Biological engineering, which is now recognized as a new engineering discipline, is engineering analysis, design, and synthesis of the sort I've just described applied to modern molecular life science. You have to know biology. You don't have to know instrumentation. You don't have to know fabrication, but you need to know information flow and biology. And th those kinds of models tell you what to build. Now, I'm showing this simply because, so I, um, actually my husband, Doug Laufenberger, who was the first department head of biological engineering at MIT, and I were just awarded um, a huge prize from the National Academy of Engineering for innovation and engineering education for establishing a new engineering discipline. That's a big thing. You don't often establish a whole new discipline of engineering and have your colleagues at the National Academy recognize it for that. And so I'm mentioning this because I think it is helpful for our discussion here. So to reiterate, biological engineering is based in molecular, um, bio, modern molecular omic science, and it uh, uses engineering to figure out the design principles for how to build things out of biology and how to intervene. It could be applied to things other than medicine, whereas medical engineering or biomedical engineering, because biological engineering clearly can be applied to medicine, is all kinds of engineering applied to medicine with no particular you know, emphasis on biology. I want to quickly chart how we develop this because I think it's instructive for NIH. So this is MIT around 1991 had engineering, school of science with biology, chemistry, et cetera. We had a program joint with Harvard Medical School that was medical engineering. Um, we started requiring biology in, the, in 1993 of all undergrads. Eric Lander taught this course. And this is a really important point. Research and teaching are intimately linked. The best researchers, they want to be in the classroom teaching. They want to teach next generation. What you learned is not a single paper. It's that whole way that you think about things. We started an interdepartmental program. I was an assistant professor. I chaired this for years and years. Should we have a major at the undergrad level? We said no, um, but we got together. We proposed to the MIT administration that we should have a program linking engineering to molecular life science, a formal program. And that didn't involve Harvard Med School. They said, yes, we launched, we recruited someone to head this program, someone who was known for engineering cell biology. We started an interdepartmental minor degree. It was MIT's first, but it was focused on biology. And then we launched an experiment. And this is really important. It was an experiment where people like me in chemical engineering put half of my appointment, half of my time into a new entity to try to do bioengineering. We had a um, mandate that we had to develop education and so on programs, but it was an experiment with a charter of how we'd be reviewed. And then of course the minor was very popular. We started a PhD program. These X's are when I had endometriosis surgery. Um, we then went on to develop an undergraduate major. We became a department. Uh, we had co-teaching across the different schools along the way. I started a company with someone I taught PCHEM with, and it was very collaborative across MIT. We had to go ask for help, um, and we finally launched an undergraduate major, the first new in 39 years, and now we're one of the most popular majors in MIT and have enormous uh, impact around the world. Um, so the emergence of this established new discipline, again, underscores you have to have education driving these changes in research. We have an urgent need for um, workforce development in gynecology. These things go hand in hand. I can't really comfortably advise young people about how they get funding in gynecology. I really don't know myself. Um, so I uh, have just a couple more slides. Um, we raise all boats by thinking about structural changes that will improve NIH collaboration. Collaboration, collaboration across institutes and centers, especially we could use gynecology as a model for doing this. No more 10 cupping, how can we develop a sustainable plan? So here's an example and I'll be done in two minutes. Um, so let's think about a way for inner IC collaboration. First of all, and I'm gonna use the example of endometriosis, there's certainly a need in gynecology uh, to collaborate with other institutes with a proposal that I might bring as an investigator to work with say gastroenterologists at MGH to look at how young people, young women with GI symptoms like my niece may have endometriosis. So there's a lot of similarities and interesting things going on in the gut. There's comorbidities um, and so on. 
Um, so there's a need in gynecology, but also gynecology, even if we just better understand menstruation processes, could benefit these other institutes. NHLBI, which was mentioned earlier, uh, sex hormone regulation of vascular properties. The methods to study this in culture don't exist. We're trying to develop them. It's a long, hard slog. There's so many other areas. Um, in IDDK, there's enormous correlates and interesting intellectual contrasts between stem cell plasticity in the gut and in the endometrium. Super interesting, also the immunology. Of course, sex hormone regulation of migraine, chronic pain, all of these things could benefit from the kinds of approaches you would develop for gynecology, approaches I described earlier. And so maybe an idea, I think we need to um, examine it, but maybe have a center, maybe have an institute, um, or maybe say there should be a center with a base budget, some kind of protective funding, and other institutes have to spend some part of their budget in collaborations with gynecology, okay? And how you do that exactly, I can't say. There's the law of unintended consequences. Do an experiment, start small, NHLBI, NIDDK, somebody, okay? The key elements, you need protective funding for gynecology and you need a substantial way to direct funding to collaborations. Without teeth, you're not gonna have anything happen. So this is the final summary of my recommendations. I'm a minute over. We desperately need an outside analysis of the funding disparity. Everybody's brought them up today, me with a little more granularity. We need, uh, and I don't know that anybody brought this up, um, analysis of how health disparities uh, in women influence the wage gap. Um, we need to let in outside people. NIH should embrace and encourage this and make it possible and not fight it. Uh, the challenges in women's health and ways to approach studying them could influence and help all uh, all diseases, we could develop a new collaborative model by taking some of the advice I just gave. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Thank you so much, um, Dr. Griffith. That was an amazing and inspiring um, 